hold on the computer. So once again, today, um, rather than cover the specifics of the lesson on typography, I wanted to discuss typography in general, cover the basics, um, the nomenclature used in um, talking about and describing typography, how type is measured, <clears throat> um, the various categories of type and that sort of thing so that when you use the tools in Illustrator, you'll understand better what in fact they're doing. In addition to that, I wanted to show you a section of a lynda.com uh, uh, interview with Simone, uh, Simone Legnone, Len, Simone Legno, um, in him creating his skateboard deck. Um, I will not be able to record that part of the, the lesson. I would be in, infringing on their copyrights. But if you have, um, go on to lacountylibrary.org and get your library card and get a PIN number, and you should be able to do that online, you will have access to all of their tutorials as well as the interview that I will be showing. Okay, so typography basics. <clears throat> um, the letter forms that I'm using right here, uh, the typeface is Roman and um, this is basically the origin of all modern typography. Um, it was from, uh, gleaned from Trajan's column in Rome. It has a unique um, proportion, uh, set of proportions. They only had capital letters at that time. Um, I'm using caps and small caps, which were non-existent at that time. But it's an elegant type. It has these little feet, these little extensions that come out called serifs. And from that, all the other groups and basic uh, families of typography were generated. Um, so I'm gonna go to categories here, scroll up. And this is available to you, this um, uh, um, slideshow is available on my website and I'll show you that when I'm done with this, how to access it, if you would like. Um, anyway, there are basically five separate categories of type. Of type. There's the serif, which is where Roman that falls into that category. And that can be, you can tell that by these little extensions that come from the end of the, the many of the letter forms, okay? Um, they do actually have a function they're not there purely for visual, um, you know, aesthetics. Um, they actually enhance the readability of type. Um, if you look at most textbooks, not all, or um, newspapers and that sort of thing, they do use um, serif typefaces, especially when the type gets fairly small. For whatever reason, it's easier to read. Later in the 20th century, as technology developed, and they were able to um, refine and to um, manipulate type a little bit more effectively. I don't know, it's not that the earlier typefaces weren't elegant and beautifully designed, it's just that they could do more with them now. Is that they generated something called a sans serif typeface, which is in French, just simply means without serifs. But in doing so, when they created sans serif typefaces, it um, opened up um, many more possibilities of different styles of type um, or category, not categories, but um, within a family of type, many more uh, fonts became available. You could have extended or you could have condensed um, fonts. Um, you could have um, italicized them. You could do almost anything. It, it allowed um, designers to do much more than what they could with the earlier um, typefaces. There's also a script, which is um, something everybody should be familiar with, but it's formalized in different um, families of typefaces and fonts. There's um, the old black letter, which is a unique category. This is, um, was basically from 
<clears throat> abroad developed early on from a broad pen. And it was um, used by the monks when they were uh, um, hand lettering manuscripts. And it was at that time until um, the, at that time they developed the lowercase letter forms. Um, so this is before, this is long ago, this is like the, you know, um, 11th, 12th century. And then the last category is decorative. And I just use this typeface because it looks a little bit, it was a little bit unique and <clears throat> looks kind of a, a torn and broken. But it, every other typeface, if it's not serif, sans serif, script, or black letter, falls into that category as being decorative. Now, when you're designing, um, let's say, an ad or, or one sheet, um, a newsletter or a magazine, something like that, typically for the body copy, you're going to use um, serif typefaces. You can use sans serif, okay, for the body copy. Um, it's unlikely that you would use script or black letter or any decorative typeface for the body copy, um, because in large chunks of text, it's just too difficult to read for the average user to read, okay? So um, typically, um, serif and sans serif can be used for body copy. It can also be used for headlines. It can be used for subheads. It can be used for everything, and that's typically what you see. For all the tens of thousands of typefaces that are available, it's um, these two categories that are used the most. Um, to convey a specific kind of mood or feeling, um, then these other categories, script, black letter, and decorative are used, but typically they're only used for headlines. It is in rare instances that um, script is used for copy, but that's, you know, for, for wedding, invitations or baby announcements and things like that, where it's just a, a, you know, a few lines of text that they want to use. Um, black letter too, I don't know if you've ever looked at a, a Carolingian, you know, manuscript, an early manuscript is very, it's teeny tiny and very difficult to read. Um, the same with decorative typefaces, if they're used in large quantity. So, um, while I'm telling you that there are five categories, they're really essentially three. There's serif, sans serif, and all the rest of these script, black letter, um, and decorative are all technically decorative, okay, by today's standards. Um, typeface follows, um, type follows um, into, um, typefaces fall into the three different categories or the category, the category, five categories follow um, into three um, different groups, subgroups. There are families of type. So for example, Helvetica would be um, a family of type within the sans serif category. And then within each of that, there, uh, there would be a particular type face um, so that we would have, we could have condensed bold all the way to bold italic. And then within each of those, if I picked, for example, Helvetica light, or in this particular case, regular, if I just selected it, then that is what is called the font. When you look in, um, in most computer graphics programs and they say, you know, do you want to pick a font? What that font refers to is a particular typeface. And within that typeface, there are several different possibilities for fonts. Sometimes there are just a few. Sometimes in particular um, Helvetica, there are many, and I have not even shown all of the possible ones in Helvetica. It's probably one of the most widely used sans serif typeface um, around. Um, what specifically the font refers to is that the designer designed all the, the capital letters, the lowercase letters, the numerals and the special characters that work in this particular um, weight of that particular typeface. And they will have to make subtle, sometimes subtle, sometimes significant changes in the design for the other fonts. Okay, so they've typically um, 
the anthropomorphized type. They break it into families. And then within each family has, there are, num you know, depending on how big your family is, uh, there are a number of unique faces. But those unique faces um, can look very similar if you see a group photograph of your, of your family. Um, you all have unique, appear unique appearance, but there's, all, there's um, certain um, aspects of your, of your family characteristics that kind of tie you together and make you look um, uh, a part of a, of a whole. And then again, the font would be an, a unique individual within the family. Okay. Um, the various parts of letter forms are as follows. Um, and there are many, many more parts than this. These are just the basic parts that I'm talking about. If you recall the other day when I was um, showing you um, the type tool, that the type rests on what is called the baseline. And I showed you in um, Illustrator how you could move the individual letter forms above or below that baseline. Um, the letter forms that are flat at the bottom generally rest on that, that baseline. And as I also mentioned yesterday, that um, if there are rounded or kind of curved letter forms, in order for them to look visually or optically like they are resting on the baseline, they actually sit below just a little bit. Okay. Now, where the lowercase letter forms rest above here, where they, you know, the, the height of them um, becomes uniform for each font. Um, this, when you draw a line across that, that is called the waistline. And then anything, any part of a letter form, specifically for lowercase letters that extends above the waistline, is called the ascender. And anything that extends below the baseline is called a descender. Right. Now, the way that um, the type is measured, and that's why oftentimes you can have two different fonts, um, and they can both be the same size, will look decidedly different. One could look larger or smaller, um, depending on how it was designed. And it's you can see that the A sender actually extends above a, um, the height of a cap in this particular instance. This is Times Roman, the letter, uh, the typeface that I use here. Okay. So um, if you want to measure your type in cap height, then it would be from the baseline to the top of the capital letter. But that wouldn't be how the type is measured itself. Type is measured from the top of the A sender to the bottom of the D sender. So if I said that this was 12, 12 point type, it would be measured from this top line here to here. So you can actually see that uh, the cap height would be considerably less than 12 points. Okay. The distance from the baseline to the waistline um, isn't talked about much anymore, but that is considered the X height. So these are the various parts of um, letter forms. Um, as I mentioned, um, type is measured in points and pythons. And to give you some reference to what that means in inches, um, you'll see in a, in a minute here that um, 12 points equal one pica, and six picas equal one inch. Therefore, if you do the math and you multiply 6 times 12, you get 72. So there are 72 points in one inch. So that gives you some reference that if you use 72 point type, that roughly from the top of the A center to the bottom of the D center, it will be one inch in height. It gives you, you know, pretty good reference. And while one point being a very small unit of measurement, 1 72nd of an inch, is discernible, that difference of one point is discernible to the, um, um, to the eye. Um, it, there is a, a, a notable difference uh, visually. Um, tie pounds get very specific and get very 
picky about um, how they want to, uh, uh, the sizes of type that they want to use. And they can argue over, you know, should we use six point or seven point type? And it may seem like a very subtle and inconsequential difference, but um, it, it can mean a lot to, um, to designers. So it is very important. And as I measured, just measured, as I mentioned just a moment ago, the distance, you know, type size, how it's measured is from the top of the A sender to the bottom of the B sender. Now, other terms that are used. Um, capital letters are also referred to as uppercase or UC. And the smaller letters are re also referred to as lowercase or LC. And where that terminology came from was um, back in the day when um, people like Benjamin Franklin, who um, uh, was a printer, um, used type and they actually had to hand set the type and they actually um, put each individual letter form together into a case, you know, to construct um, something that they would print. And the reason that uppercase became, capital letters became known as uppercase and small letters became known as lowercase is just because the boxes of letters that they pulled from were in cases that were above or uppercase and the small letters were in low, lowercase below. Um, as I showed you yesterday, the, um, the selective spacing between letters, individual letters and words is called kerning. And I showed you the tool for that. So that's a very important term that's used in um, typography. And I also showed you the tool in, in the type, within the type tool that allows you to use tracking, which is the uniform adjustment of space between and then, you know, letters and words, not just between individual letters, but between, could be an entire line of type. And then the last term that we, um, that I talked about yesterday too, was the letting. And that's the space between lines of type. And again, this term, which um, continues today, but was um, developed years ago, again, in the, the times of, a. Uh, um, uh, you know, early typography is that when they hand set type, um, you know, actually put them in, in boxes and, and tied them up to be able to print. Um, in order to add space between lines, they would put little slivers of lead. And that was how they had to do that. And so that's how that term came to be. So Benjamin Franklin, um, you know, is one of our country's most famous printers. Um, these are the, the terms and the things that he would use. Um, this is not technical. This is really, this isn't really a headline. This is really a masthead to a newspaper. But if it were an ad, typically um, how, they don't have to be laid out this way, but um, think of most common design is an inverted pyramid. Um, the most important elements are usually at the top, not always, and they're usually the largest element on the page, but not always. There are other ways around that, um, depending on your design. So if this were an ad, then typically the headline would be near the top, okay? And then other type, um, in this particular case, these are not, these are headlines here. Um, in a magazine or news or a newspaper, but here in an, in an ad, this would become a subhead. So that typically is the type is much smaller. Okay, and then the copy or the bulk, the big chunks of, of text that you read um, is called copy or you know body copy. Um, but also notice in the design of. of this as well as that the larger, the more important articles, again, are near the top. The images that they use um, for, the, for the article that um, support the, the text are larger. And the elements of the, the ad or the, in this case, um, 
um, the news, the newspaper, um, or that are less important or smaller and near the bottom. Okay. So again, more terms, headline, subhead, and copy. Um, so when you are designing for a, a newspaper or you're designing a small brochure or a book or whatever, if you're wondering, well, what size type should I use for the copy? Well, there's generally a range of sizes, but it usually goes from eight to 13 point, okay, for the copy. And the width of a column can range from 13 and a half um, picas to 48. And the reason that they don't get any smaller than 13 and a half or any larger than 48 picas, especially if you, if you were to look at your textbook, the reason that Typically, books, no matter no matter how big the book is, they don't the a block of text doesn't get any wider than 48 picas. Is that it's difficult for your eye to track from one line to the next. And likewise, um, if you're looking at the columns of of text in a newspaper, they don't get any narrower than 13 and a half picas because again, it would break up the text too much and that would make it difficult to read as well. So you can have lines of type that are too long or too short. Um, the range and size of hub subheads too can be quite significant. And this generally, the sizes that I'm using here would be for something that's eight and a half by 11, or even could be um, for a tabloid size, 11 by 17. Subheads generally range from, you know, 14 to 18 point. And headlines can start, maybe for a small little gatefold brochure, can start at 24 point and can be as large as you want them to be, depending on how you decide to design your, um, your piece. Okay. Um, so let me pause my... Uh, this and let me show you where this can be found in a minute. I'm going to go ahead and go back. And if you look at, you know, either a handouts page or this week in class, you can see right here under ancillary lectures, here is the typography primer. This is the one that I have. This is the one that I just pulled from. So you're welcome to look at that anytime if you, uh, if you find it helpful. We want to refer to it for the terminology that's used and that sort of thing. Okay. So um, next thing I wanted to show you. Um, now I cannot record this, so I'm going to stop recording this. But this will be um, building a skateboard deck by Simone Ilano. Um, so I'm going to. I'll continue to share but I'm going to pause the, the recording of this and then we'll watch this and you can see examples of his illustrations, how he lays it out, how he uses the template as a guide, the structure, the overall design of the skateboard. And I think, um, you know, the reason I chose skateboards is that they're kind of, they're, it's a contemporary um, kind of thing to apply a two dimensional design to. It's also, um, a unique shape. It's um, long and narrow and rather than a, a strict, you know, rectangle that you would see, a typical rectangle that you would see in a page size, eight and a half by 11 or 11 by 17. And that might make it a little bit more of a challenge for you to design to make it work in, in a coherent uh, fashion. So I'm going to go ahead here and I'm going to pause my um, recording.